Bravo, I'm going to ask that you fasten your seatbelts. Launch sequence. Launch sequence activated. Launch sequence activated. Five, four, three, two, one. Hold on. We were muted. Damn it, we were muted. You know what? I'm doing all that over again because I don't give a shit. My show. You fasten your seatbelts. Launch sequence. We're doing it over. Launch sequence activated. Launch sequence activated. Five, four, three, two, one. Everybody. Welcome to the launch cast. We did that intro, but we were muted the first time, and I don't care. I'll do it again. It doesn't matter because we have technical difficulties here. All good. Uh, again, with me today, my guest, First Lieutenant Robbie Plotkin, is an Airborne Ranger, qualified infantry officer for the United States Army in the 3rd Armor Brigade. Combat Team 4th Infantry Division. Wow, a mouthful. First Lieutenant Plotkin is currently back home from his first deployment to the Middle East in support of Operation Inherent Resolve. He is a former pro MMA fighter and pro kickboxer and has held multiple amateur titles. Robbie trained with the fight team Saralongo and he's a fourth degree black belt in Kempo Martial Arts and also holds a master's degree in sports science and nutrition and has worked as a private and collegiate strength and conditioning coach. God damn. God damn. What have you not done, man? Holy cow. That's a that's a mouthful, dude. So happy to have you here today, man. Man, I'm super, I'm excited. super excited to be here. I appreciate you welcoming me on the show to help close out 2019 for you. Yeah, man. It's uh it's our New Year's show, dude. It's our New Year's show and we're talking uh we're going to talk about resolutions a little bit. We're going to talk about our year and how important it was to to our growth. Um, and I can't think of a better guy to, to do this with. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to say something, and I'm, and I'm going to ask you about that. I'm going to say thank you for your service, dude. Wow, wow. Thank yeah. you for your support. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel when people ask you that, uh, when people say that to you? Um, I feel appreciative, really. Um, but I feel like I, I haven't done enough yet. I know, uh, you know everyone makes sacrifices for everyone that they care about, and I'm just uh, you know, looking to do a little bit more. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's big because, um, you know, with the type of sacrifice that you made, obviously, as uh, as a member of the U.S. military, obviously, it's, you know, the ultimate sacrifice that people can make to, to protect us here. Um, and sort of the, the journey there uh, was long, right? It was it was a it was a long way getting there. It took your whole life to kind of get to. That oh, yeah. Point. Oh, yeah. It almost escaped me. But uh, when I look back on my life, everything has set me up to be successful in the military. Yeah. And I know we'll tap on that uh, as we continue this podcast. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, so first question, man, this is the question that I, I always ask everybody as we start. Robbie, are you a leader? Yeah, 100 percent. I am a leader um, for sure. Yeah. So so what's your definition of a leader? Um, my definition of a leader, well, the Army will define leadership as uh, one's ability to provide purpose and direction and able to uh, increase a, a person or an op uh, uh, operation, right? right? Um, so, but my, uh, my definition of a leader is something that someone does, who they are, 
and what they do and also what they don't do because people are always looking at you and they always see things so it's based on your energy and what you give off right um it, it's it's doing the right thing and, and helping increase someone's potential to be successful at life and obtain joy right that's a that's a big part of it is joy so i know that you use the word hero a lot uh in a few different respects and we'll sort of get to that but for you is there a difference between a hero and a leader i think it all encompasses around the, the same thing um when, when I use hero, it's really to promote that, in the, in, that internal leadership ability to help other people out. And that, that's what a hero does, and that's also what, a, what it takes to have leadership. Yeah, man. Um, so, so I'm going to talk a little bit about your, your current status, right? So, so you just came home from your first tour of duty in the Middle East uh, in support of Operation Inherent Resolve. How, how was that for you? I mean, I know we chatted a few times while you were – uh, away and deployed, but how was that for you in terms of your expectations uh, as a leader, right, at, versus what, what actually manifested there? Well, while I was deployed overseas, I got to help the organiz organization out a lot. Um, in terms of leadership, I wasn't in charge of that many people. I was set out on a couple different uh, mission sets uh, as the lone wolf to work with uh, different military uh, teams and operations, foreign as well as our domestic U.S. Uh, military in the Air Force, um, and it, through those interpersonal s skills, uh, be the liaison officer between our forward uh, deployed unit as well as our, our rear unit in support. Right. And, and I know we talked about some of the stuff going on uh, coming up this year, but you, you told me that you're looking to become a platoon leader as you return to Fort Carson, Colorado in the new year, right, uh, to begin a new uh, train-up cycle for the future conflicts within the infantry brigade. Roger, yeah, so I'll have uh, around uh, 40 men and women underneath me combine uh, and uh, help them progress in, the, in their career as well as their family life as well. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's important. And we'll, we'll kind of get to, to that and, and how all these different aspects of your leadership play out. But I wanna sort of do what I do here on the launch cast and, and, and rewind it back, take it back to the beginning um, where this journey started for you, right? Because as everybody that listens to this knows, uh, this podcast is about the unconventional journey, right? We're, we're right. trying to get people to understand, like I look at you now, man, you're, you're a guy that's, um, you know, your, your physicality, first of all, your physical presence is, is huge when you're in a room with, with Robbie Plotkin, right? Because uh, you're a guy that takes your health and wellness so seriously. Um, you know, you're a first lieutenant in the army, you're an army ranger. Um, that's big for somebody to walk in and see that persona, right? right. But I've known you for many years, uh, having met you through Kempo Martial Arts, and then we, you know, we became good friends subsequently over the years. Um, and I saw a big genesis in you, but I didn't even know you as a kid. So that journey was much bigger for you, starting out as a kid, getting to this point. Right. Right. And that's what we want people to understand that, look, you see a guy like this that's a leader in the U.S. Army, you know, the, the highest honor somebody can have really in this country uh, in terms of leadership. And he wasn't always this leader. Right. Mm -hmm. He wasn't always this guy that was comfortable leading men into battle, uh, potentially. Um, and, and that journey is something that's important to, to the listeners of this podcast. So what I want to start with, really, and then we'll, we'll sort of take it back to your childhood is. I know you as a, as a person that really cares about family and your family support system is, is huge to you. Talk about that in terms of what that's meant to you over the years in a general sense. Yeah, well, I mean, I keep learning every day uh, what that really means to me and, and, and how lucky and fortunate I am. I'm absolutely blessed when it comes to uh, my family dynamics, not just uh, my family, as in my parents and brother and sister, but as in my my uncles, my grand my grandparents that have in, have inspired me and that I've learned uh, so much from and 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 look to emulate as well. Yeah. Um, and and my cousins, our whole dynamic, we always we support each other. We're always there for each other. It doesn't matter how big or how small. We're each other's biggest fans. Right. And uh, and and we carry each other through the tough times, and we're there through the good times as well. And that's, that's important in terms of um, building that leadership over the years. You know, people, I've noticed that people don't have that, that don't have that support system going into their formative years. Uh, they could really take a totally different path. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I know we've talked about some stories with you, which we'll get into, where you had a couple of moments in your life where you were 
you were sort of faced with decisions on how to move forward, and it's interesting the choices you made, you know, to become the, the guy you are today. So um, we'll take it back to young Robbie, right? Yeah. Um, we'll take it back to before you were better looking and in better shape than like ninety percent of the male species on the planet. Um, you were an aggressive kid, right? I, yeah, I, w- I, w- I was. I was a very imaginative kid, and and I was pr- I was pretty aggressive. I I needed a good outlet. And, and sports was not it for me. I was not coordinated. Yeah, yeah. Which is, it's, it's totally not for everybody, but it's interesting how um, you took that outlet. And, and I know you told me this story a little bit, but uh, your parents used to see you running around like a Power Ranger, right? Pretending yeah, you're a that, ninja. Right, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I just thought I, thought I was going to save the world from alien invaders. And, <laughs> yeah, I, I, just, I just fought imaginary ghosts and... And space ninjas all the time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I was morphing, increasing power levels. So it was, and I was dancing around on baseball fields, and they were like, "Well, let's pull this kid out. Yeah, and uh, let's let's try something that uh, that he seems to enjoy." Yeah, and before you jumped into that, I know there was a story of uh, a big fight that you had as a as a kid, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Uh, I I just remember being on the playground. And one of my buddies got jumped, and I maybe I was in kindergarten or first grade, and so I, one kid was pushing him around and everything like that. So I ran over and I pushed this kid back, and and I st- and I stood up for him, and and you know because someone was attacking my friend, and and that was not okay. So this kid goes away, he grabs another friend, and they're a year older than me, and they throw me down on the ground, they pin me, and they punch me in my stomach, and I just remember crying and as a kid it just seemed like I was left alone forever right and that and I was helpless right so I knew then that I didn't want to be that person uh who couldn't who couldn't help others and who couldn't help themselves right right and so that outlet for you um when you saw that aggression happening your parents saw that aggression happening and and you knew that sports wasn't the outlet you jumped into martial arts right right seven years old right seven years old yes so Knowing you all these years later and having trained under you for a bit as well, um, what was the mindset, if you can remember, of seven-year-old Robbie starting martial arts? Absolute pure excitement. Yeah. I mean, I, I found what I wanted to do, and it was awesome. I wanted to do it every day. I went home and practiced, and I became that kid who would watch TV and practice martial arts or sit in a split, do anything to get better at that craft. Right. Right, and that that mindset uh, over time, and I know somebody that that was involved in martial arts for a few years, um, that mindset changes because your I guess your preconceived notions of martial arts when you first jump in. Although everybody always says, you know, this is for self defense, this is you know for the body, mind, and spirit, and and whatever. You know, that when you first jump into it, you're like, yeah, I'm gonna be able to kick some ass. Yeah, right. Yeah, I remember when I so I got my black belt when I was 13, and I remember one of my best friends at the time. Uh, also got his black belt. And I remember his dad was just like, hey, you got your black belt, but what does it mean? You know, you, you, you're 13. You right. can't do anything with it. Right. And maybe that was true then. Uh, I'm sure we would have done well against any other 13-year-old. But to take what we had stored in us, that was just that, that, that response. Yeah. Right? Um, it was innate at that point. We, ju- we just had it built in us. Um, and to use it later on. Right. You know, it becomes a reflex. Right. Exactly. Of, right. Yeah. And that's that's the whole point of it. The whole point of it is that muscle memory from a physical side and then mentally over time when it becomes a reflex where you can really just defend yourself no matter what. Right. Whenever you need. Um, I have yet to hit that point. But yes. Yeah. Blue stripe. Well, forever. you know, blue stripe forever. Yeah. <laughs> um, the walls remember. <laughs> the walls remember. <laughs> We're not going to talk about that. Yeah, story. No, we won't. We won't. <laughs> Um, so, you know, you're, you're, you're continuing on seven year old Robbie starts martial arts, 13 year old Robbie has his black belt. Um, but it wasn't all easy for you, right? You were bullied as a teenager. I was, I was, um, I had really severe, uh, cystic acne. Um, and it actually pulled me out of the game for, for a while as well. When, uh, the cyst got really big, uh, and it covered my body, I wasn't able to roll around on the ground. I wasn't able to to touch people. Uh, my face was constantly bleeding because the cysts were so big and when Jeez. they would dry up, 
Uh, so I had to go on uh, some special uh, medication, and we always credit my uh, dermatologist for saving my life yeah. because, uh, yeah, he really did. My mindset was not good at that time. Well, it takes a mental toll. Oh, yeah, that. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, b- between being bullied uh, by other people, my perception of myself um, was, was really low as well. So I was bullying myself in my head as well. Yeah, that's hard. That's hard, man. As as a, a kid that um, went through some bullying myself, um, although not not to that level, it's crazy to think of how that affects you over a lifetime. Because I, I look at myself, man, and I and I've talked about my journey, uh, you know, throughout the years and my growth to this point on this podcast. But you know, I look at myself in my twenties, let's say, as a whole, and that was an angry dude, mm. right? And that was because of bullying that happened in, in different ways, right. you know, not, of not course. like the conventional bullying that you'd think of. Um, but that happened because, you know, you, at a certain point, right, you get to a point physically where you realize, you make that realization that, well, I'm bigger than these people and I'm tougher than these people. And it becomes this thing of like, well, you can't bully me because I'll just turn around and kick your ass, right. you know? And, and it's hard for a teenager that, that has a black belt too, by the way. And you weren't this, um, th- this physical being that you are now when you were 13, but you have a black belt, you have a skill set, yet you're still being bullied. And that, that sort of dichotomy of like, hey, I'm being bullied, but I should be able to take care of that bullying, that'll screw you up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and I was the karate kid uh, by definition for everybody until I proved that. Uh, Oh yeah, let's uh actually he he knows what he's doing. Yeah. And uh, and some and some people had to find out firsthand. Yeah, and that uh that's a story I wanna I wanna talk about because you know, you went through that um and that mindset really gets screwed up during that time. And then when you were a junior in high school, it was a huge fight, right? There there was a huge fight. I got kicked out of school for, for quite some time, almost five and a half weeks. Yeah. I didn't I didn't know that about you until we we spoke about this in the pre-interview uh i knew that that you had some bullying issues but that's five and a half weeks dude for for a guy that i know that's a straight laced dude like you right you know that's an army lieutenant right now yeah to yeah, hear yeah. That. i mean i i completely was defending myself yeah so so i forgot to mention that i was already in a fight earlier that year yeah um it was something with it was something with a girl and uh got it and and me and this kid, me and this kid were friends, and and then he called me out, and it was fine, and I was trying to save our relationship as friends. But then he said that he was going after my my family, and he was gonna do something to my sister. Yeah. So I was like, well, let's meet up. Yeah. So we met up, we took care of business, and at that point, now I'm thinking, well, shit, I'm fucking Robbie Plock, and everybody knows it. Who yeah. wants to mess with me? Right. So, to caveat into the story that you were telling, I'm now sleeping in the in the lunchroom, I'm I'm tired. I, I already ate. I'm sleeping in the lunchroom. Kid, uh, kid already beat up my uh, friend, and I I called him out on it. And so he taps me on the shoulder. He goes, "Hey, can we go outside and and can I talk to you?" And I thought, I thought, well, shoot, you know, he definitely wants to talk to me because who wants to fight me? Right. You know, I mean, I'd want to fight me, but that's just because I'm crazy. <laughs> you know, I, I'm crazy, and uh, always looking for a good challenge. So he brings me outside, and I just remember as we turned the corner. Uh, there, there were these blocks, and all of his friends were standing by the blocks. Right. I mean, there were there were people out there who knew what was going down, right? Right. And my senses are just aware as fuck right now. Right. And he's he's walking in front of me. He turns around, and I just see this punch coming at me, and it was just the most slowest thing in the world to me, right? And I just remember leaning back, Wah! and then that was it. I I, <laughs> I closed the distance, finished it. And my head is going crazy. Um, I was wearing a, a white striped shirt at the time, so I go back into the cafeteria trying to be all nonchalant. There's blood covered. There's his blood, wow. his blood, all over me. And people are looking at me like, "Robbie, what the hell just happened? Did you right. have a nosebleed?" And I was just like, "Oh man, I got to get out of here." But at that point, um, yeah, it it got discovered what happened. So, yeah, uh, yeah. So I got kicked out of school f- for quite some time. Wow. But, that's insane. That's scary, right? It's scary when you have certain abilities and you get into a mode like that. Yeah, I, I didn't know. It was just this heightened sense of awareness, and I, I, I was raging. I was raging. I still wasn't the happiest kid at the time, and I had figured out what I, what I could do, and I, I was going to use it. You know, I won't start a fight, but I will damn for sure finish one. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, 
you come back, right, five and a half weeks out of school, um, you come back, and there's sort of a changed Robbie uh, that comes back. Robbie is now bigger. You discovered weight training, working out. Um, it wasn't just the splits in front of the TV anymore. You wanted to build up the body now. Right, yeah, for sure. Um, one, of my, one of my older cousins, he uh, was a personal trainer at the time. And, you know, we had all sorts of weights at our house. And he taught me what to do. And I became dedicated to that. Um, I had nothing to do. The tutors came after school hours. So I had all morning uh, just, just to work out. Yep, yep. And so what was, what was that mindset? Was there... Was that just the time, you know, like when, uh, like when somebody goes to jail for a year and they just work out? Yeah, the whole time? I, I, I guess I, I think so, you know. And I also was in that perfect age of where my hormones were going crazy, and you, you know. Could grow. I, I you were right, ready. I, I could grow. Yeah. So you know, I started taking supplements. I started eating a pound of pasta a night, and I put on weight. And in five and a half weeks, there was a change, and I came back to school, and. It was noticeable. It was noticeable. People started questioning whether or not I did steroids, which I've been all natural my whole life, by the way. Yeah. And I made sure that I shut them up real quick. Yeah. And uh, and they were like, okay, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you just you you just look different. But uh, but hard work. Uh, but hard work. I uh, I love it. I'm obsessed with it. Uh, everything about health and and fitness and making myself better, increasing my potential so that I can help other people as well. Um, I think I can handle it. So I I, I put that pressure on me to do so yeah so so even though that was born out of a, a traumatic incident um you know you you got to discover uh, a, a part of your life that would soon become really important to you in terms of that that health and nutrition and that physicality and and what it meant to transform oh yeah and help others transform right. and so uh so you finish out <coughs> excuse me so you finish out high school uh, and you start college, right? Uh, right. You went to, to Albany for the first year and then you came back um, and you joined the kickboxing and fight team, right, at Kempo? Yes, yes, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I came back and, uh, I mean, I had entered tournaments uh, when I was younger and I would lose the point sparring matches and get disqualified. They'd say, just, uh, you were just too aggressive. You, you can't knock the person down. Right. It's only a light tap. You, you know how point sparring yep. is. Yep. And then so I would have uh, my instructors, they would sneak me into the 18 and older semi-full contact events where it was just a time fight for one minute and whoever dominated won. And I was 16 at the time, but they would always say, but I would, at that point I was a little bit of a bigger kid as well because I was tall. And they would be like, yeah, no, 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 he, he's 18, he's 18. So right. when I came back from college, they were like, hey, you're here, you're back, you're, you're working here at Kempo, do you want to join the fight team? Yeah. Yeah, and, and for those of you that don't uh, really know what Kempo is, I'll, I'll talk about it. In the, this is where I met Robbie, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little while. Um, so Kempo uh, is part of the Kaju Kempo system. So it's karate, judo, uh, uh, kem, Kempo, uh, Chinese boxing. Chinese boxing, right. right. Um, yeah. So it's, it's really like the original mixed martial art. Right, it really is. In, in reality, and it was a really cool system. Uh, I joined up with Kempo after my – daughter was born my first child was born and Robbie had been doing it for years already and we met up there um but uh Robbie was uh within our system was was a legend right Robbie was every time I would go it would it was like oh Robbie's off at Rampage Jackson's camp in in <laughs> Albuquerque Robbie's this Robbie's that um and so uh so so I know how how huge part of your life uh, Kempo was and and the fight team um but on the other side of things, when you came back from Albany, you decided to now study economics at Stony Brook, right. which was not really your thing. No, it, was, it wasn't the, the path I wanted to be on. I wanted to uh, go into the business school, even though I didn't want anything, didn't want to do the business anyway. It just sounded good on paper, right? But couldn't get into the business program. Uh, so I did the economics with the, with the minor in business. Yeah. Let me ask you. Um, what kind of – I know your father for you is just a huge figure in your life. Oh, and, yeah. and you have a lot of love for him. What kind of influence – I'm not asking you if he influenced you, but what, what kind of influence was your decision to go into economics was your father? Well, he had a 
he's he's a businessman himself. Yeah. I know uh, when I was born, and I and I always it it blows my mind. But you know, he was like, "Yeah, Robert John Plotkin. That's a good business name." And I'm like, "Who looks at this beautiful baby boy as I was, <laughs> right?" And goes, "Ah, this is a good business name for him when he's an old man," you know. Uh, so, but uh, but I mean, not to rat on the guy. Because I, I, I do. He, he's the man. We just had a great day in the city yesterday. We always do the coolest things. He always, uh, he, he misses me so much when I'm gone and yeah. always plans great stuff for us. But he's been there for me uh, my whole life to, to direct me and, ju- and just really support, support me. And I think as a kid, I didn't understand uh, his words and what they actually meant. Um, and how supportive that they were. And I thought they were more directive than they were um, just guidance. Right. Right. So I I still didn't know what I wanted to do. And so, hey, hey, here was this man who was successful. He had the family, and I knew who I was to my core. So I felt, you know, maybe I could handle both somehow and make it work. Yeah, yeah. And and having that influence, because I sort of went through that in my life a little bit, having that influence where you have family that that, um, works in a certain industry and is successful, you kind of look at it and go like, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe that's the direction I should go. And then it's funny when you potentially jump into it or jump into it for for a little bit and you go yeah no this isn't right this isn't yeah, for yeah, me. yeah yeah this isn't my core um but you did it and you finished out at stony brook uh mm-hmm. for economics but there was a part uh of you that wanted to do hotel management for a while right um hospital management hospital management yes, yes yes yeah yeah no hospital management because uh, i knew i wanted to help people okay and uh i remember when i saw patch adams as a kid um I just, I just thought it was great. And I knew that's not what uh, hospital management was. Yeah. But I knew that if I could somehow work in an industry that I knew would directly help people. Sure. Right? Um, that that's where I wanted to be. Sure. Sure. So, but, I, but I didn't end up following it. Yeah. You, you, in fact, finished out school and you, you did an internship and uh, you tried, right? You, you, wanted to, you wanted to try at the business world, but right. it didn't speak to you. Yeah, no, it, I, it didn't connect. My dad hooked me up with one of his best friends, and I, and I worked in the city, but unfortunately, it was a very busy time for them, and I was just the filing cabinet guy, and I organized the filing cabinet, and I didn't learn much, so I didn't get that, that taste that, hmm, I want to do this. Yeah, yeah, I, and, and we know as leaders that when we're not passionate about something, we can't be effective leaders. Right. So, so all right, so, so you finish out college in 2008. So my question for you there is, where were you both personally and professionally once you graduated college? So I had, I had no clue. And I remember, I remember specifically when I had just heard a, heard a quote, and it was my graduation party from, uh, from college. And I was giving a speech in front of everyone because I'm big, spe- big speech givers in, in my family. And I remember saying, I have no idea what I want to do. I have this economics degree, and I know I'm not going to use it. And I said, ancient philosopher Rumi once quoted, sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment. And I think that's when I started my journey on, on trying to increase that, that potential within myself and see where it goes and just perfect a craft that I love and keep figuring it out. Yeah, yeah, and, and you did that, and, and that sort of started your journey uh, in terms of pro fighting, well, amateur fighting and then pro fighting. Um, personally, where were you um, in terms of your personal situation? In terms of my personal situation, um, I was with, with my girlfriend at the time. I was fighting, and, 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 I, love, and I loved fighting, but I knew that there needed to be more. Um, one of my sh- strength coaches, who was also from the Kempo area, told me hey why don't you become a personal trainer with he- with us here so i went that personal trainer route yeah. and that's when i started being able to help people you know f- physically as well right um and at what point after that did you officially make the decision that you were going to start a fighting career i mean i think i already knew i at that point i was already fighting for, for three years and and i was i was really good as an amateur kickboxer yeah um so I just wanted to keep going with it. Yeah. Career-wise, I was it was always that's what I wanted to be successful at and I wanted to find a job that could support that um that would give me the flexible hours enough so that I can pursue that right. because I had all the belief in myself that I could make it to the top. Right. And that that sort of brings us to where I met you for the first time. So um I think it was let me let me think back timeline was had to be 
2009. I would say 2009. 2009, exactly, yes. 2009, yeah, I'm 23 yeah. at the time. Yeah, yeah. so, so yeah. I'm in Kempo, and I was – it was a Saturday morning, and I had, heard, I had heard about Robbie, the legendary Robbie. I had never met him because Robbie was away at Rampage Jackson's uh, camp in, in Albuquerque, Gre- right? Greg Jackson, Greg Jackson. Greg Jackson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. so, um, so I'm, I'm in my test, right, and I think it was my – orange belt test i would think right and yeah. and what happens is so that that's so it's white yellow orange, orange. and and orange is where you can begin sparring in, in kempo and so we had a pack test right the, the way the tests work are uh you know everybody at all age levels are there testing and they sort of take you aside and and you know you, you test individually on your forms your your this and that and there's some group testing sometimes there's sparring involved in these tests and right. so this was a monster test right it was only my 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 second one there but i had witnessed a couple because i had friends i'd made friends that were were their great friends and uh and it was a lot of kids on the test and there was a lot of adults on the test and so here we are in the middle of my early on in right. the test and in comes Robbie, right? And I'm like, who the fuck is this guy, right? Yeah. And, back and he from the walks, Crusades. And he walks <laughs> in back from the Crusades, and, and the whole thing just stops, right? And everybody's like, hey, Robbie, and giving hugs. And I'm like, yo, we're in the middle of a test, dude, you know? And so our, our instructor, um, Adam, mm-hmm. or, uh, or, or Sifu, um, asked Robbie, because we had two dojos, he goes, hey, Robbie, can you do me a favor? Because we have a huge test today. Can you take all the adults in the back dojo and test them while I handle the kids? Yeah, no problem. This motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> I walked out of this test bloody. Yeah. Right? It was amazing. It was amazing. But I, my buddy Ed, our buddy Ed, was on that test as well, getting his brown stripe candidate um, and uh, and Ed said that that test was harder than his black belt test. Yeah. Robbie had us in the back sparring first, like all, all these like strength and conditioning exercises where he pounded us until we were like dead. I had no energy left, and then we had to spar. And so I spar with this other guy, uh, Greg, who's a couple of years older than me, and, and we're on the ground grappling, and we could both hold our own. But it got to a point where I wound up like ripping open a scar on Greg, like a twenty-year-old scar that he had on his neck because I had him in a choke. I have blood all over my gi. Greg has blood all over his gi. He pounded me too, and I just walked out of there completely beaten and bloody. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> all right, that's who this guy is. Yeah. <laughs> so subsequently, we became friends after that. I don't know how that happened. But right. <laughs> Well, because I brought out the best in you. You did, actually. And you were a legend in that dojo, really. You really were. Uh, everybody respected you. And, and I should have seen that right from the get-go that you walked in. And there was so much respect for you uh, in that dojo for, for what you had accomplished and, and the martial artist that you were. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, so that sort of leads us to – I'm going to look at the time. This is a perfect time, and I know I know you're all going to hate this, but this is a perfect time – to cut off the live stream, right? So the way this podcast works for those that have never watched it before is we do the first half hour or so live, um, and then the rest of it will get recorded right after we jump off now. And the live podcast goes on everywhere where podcasts are available next Monday morning at 6 a.m. So one week from today, this full podcast, episode 104, Be All You Can Be, will be available on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Stitcher, Podbean, Pandora. Get me on there. We're still waiting. It should be another week or two and we'll be on. Um, and so we're going to leave you here. Uh, what we're going to get into now is really interesting. Uh, and you're not going to want to miss this. We're going to talk about some personal stuff. We're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about divorce. We're going to talk about um, the tumultuous time in Robbie's life in terms of um, success and failure in his professional fighting career, some opportunities, opportunity to fight in front of Dana White of the UFC. Um, and then we're going to talk about the Army. We're going to talk about going hero. We're going to talk about Robbie Spark yeah. moments. So much to talk about, oh, man. Yeah. So I'm, I'm excited to continue this. Uh, what I want to say is um, get on there 
and follow this podcast at the Launchcast Show. Follow me at Launchpad CEO. Robbie, huh? anything you want to plug? Yeah, guys, everyone, thanks for listening so far. Please, yeah, if you have any questions and you can't find the link to this, hit me up, DM me. I got yeah. you. Yeah, we're. Uh, uh, you you got to make sure you subscribe and review and download all of these podcasts. Our newest episode just came out this morning with Matt Campo, CEO of the Ronald McDonald House. So that was an awesome episode. It just went live on, on Apple Podcasts and everywhere else. Um, and big announcement right now. Huge, huge announcement. We just solidified this this morning. Next week's guest is insane. We are going to have the legendary Carol Silva, anchor of News 12 News that just retired. She is an amazing human being, has an incredible story for those that have been following what's been going on with her these last few months. Uh, Carol and I became friendly during my TEDx Farmingdale period uh, over the summer and in the fall, and I'm so excited to have her on. So tune in next Monday live for that. We may go a little longer on the live part for you guys, um, and then the, the full podcast will be available next week. So uh, thank you for being here, Robbie. We'll continue right after the break here. Oh, yeah. Later, guys. It's terminated. Into the black.